A couple of years ago, as my wife and I were coming back home from a visit to some friends in St. Louis, we stopped to visit Cahokia Mounds, which is an area of uh, Native American interest. It's an archaeological site where you can see mounds, which are the remains of that ancient civilization. Uh, that happened a couple of years ago, it was a fun experience, an interesting visit, very instructive. And then, a couple of weeks ago, I heard that Victory Point Games has come out with a game which is precisely about the, the, the Cahokia culture, the culture of the mound builders uh, around Cahokia. And I thought, well, that's cool. On top of that, uh, this is also a game that is based on one of my favorite game systems, which is the State of Siege system by Victory Point Games. So I knew that I had to try it. And try it, I did. Uh, Solitaire game, states of siege system, so you probably know the general concepts by now. If not, it means that there are many of my video reviews that you should watch because I did cover several games in the system. The idea is that you control, uh, in this case, a civilization, in other games you control other political or military entities. You are surrounded and sieged by forces that adv advance against you along point-to-point -point paths. If they ever reach your central area, you lose the game. Other games add different wrinkles. There are many different ways in which the system is implemented from game to game. Uh, and I have to say, in this game, yet again, I saw how the system can be reinvented in vastly different ways. This game does feel very different from pretty much any other victory point games in the State of Siege system that they played in the past. Okay, so you represent the culture of the Cahokia Mound Builders, that is your central area. The game covers a span of several centuries from ancient times all the way to the Spanish times. So the game is divided in three areas, the Hopewell area, era, uh, the Mississippi era, and then the Spanish era. You have a marker there to remind you of the hero. You start in the Hopewell, then you get to the Mississippi, and at the end you will have the Spanish era. And the first uh, era, the Hopewell, really feels different from the other two eras and from anything else that I've seen in the State of Siege system. Um, some general concepts first. Um, this is your central area, you have protections, you have defenses around Cahokia, and during the game you can spend actions to purchase clicks to improve your defenses. If an opponent is trying to enter that area and you fail a defense roll, then you lose a click in your defenses. If the defenses are on the last click, which is this one, and the opponent again um, managed to attack the defenses, your defense roll fails, you flip this to the breach side at that point if the enemy is trying to enter they do enter and you lose the game immediately. You will need to spend actions to repair your your defenses before you can even think of then uh, improving them by purchasing clicks. You cannot improve your defenses if they are on their breach side. Around your areas at the beginning of the game you place uh, these markers here. You select them randomly from a cup. These are called chiefdoms. They have two sides, an unmounted side and a mounded side. Representing an area, each chiefdom represents an area, represents the resources that are to be found in the area, there may be other symbols, and at the beginning of the game as these uh, are drawn, they are placed on their unmounted side, the unmounted side face up. Uh, what you're trying to do in this game, in the initial phases of the game, is to take control of a good area. Not just to take uh, control of as vast an area as possible, but to take control of an area that you can actually dominate. Um, I'll explain how that works. The game starts in the Hopewell era, when you have a small deck of cards which you use to represent the era of prosperity and expansion that that the game starts with. In the first phase of the game, when you're using these green cards, everything is fine. Um, nobody's attacking you, you're expanding your 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 empire, and you do that by well spending actions. So you flip a card 
there may be a revolt, most likely there will be one, I'll explain revolts later, but actually let's talk about it now. Uh, the card tells you the track where the revolt takes place. For example, here we have a Kado, well then we have a Kado, this is the Kado track. Uh, you roll a die to determine which box of the track is the one where the revolt happens. Um, it, generally speaking, if it is an area that you control, then you have to deal with it. You may suffer from that. If it is an area outside of your control, you do not have to worry Or in the early phases of the game. Later in the game, it may even be an advantage to you. Suppose that later in the game, there is, for example, an enemy army here. If the... Uh, a revolt happens in an area that you control then the and you cannot stop it then the enemy army takes advantage of it by advancing if it happens in the back then the enemy army has to face a revolt in their own territory and actually they have to retreat along that path which is of course useful to you so you resolve a revolt then uh, there may be modifiers uh, that indicate if uh, one or several um, or several of the civilizations that you're fighting against, one of the several hostile civilizations, is in decline or in a phase of prosperity. This symbol means decline, and you have a marker to remind you of that. The other indicates ascension. That means that if you if a certain civilization is in decline, what do you do? At least what I did, I place the marker by that track as a reminder. And uh, there are advantages in that in that phase, as long as the culture is in decline, if you're attacking it or if you're trying to take control of, of that area, of that region. There are advantages if you act against uh, civilization which is in decline and penalties. The plus one applies to them, it's good to them. And penalties if you are attacking or trying to interact with a culture which is in ascension. Um, then you get action points. Early in the game your action points are printed in black in a white circle. In later in the game things were collected differently, differently. There will be cards that give you a number in printed in white in a black uh, background. Now if it's this one, black on white, very simple. This indicates the number of action points that you receive. Suppose it's three. Then you use the storage pits here to keep track of the actions that you have. You spend action points, you move that to keep track of how many actions you have left. You can save one action point at the beginning of the game. Uh, there is an optional rule that tells you that you can spend resources to improve your stretch bits and in that case you'll be able to save two action points for the future. But you start with the ability of saving one from turn to turn. Later, once you're done with this, you may encounter cards that have the number printed, there you go, in black. In that case, you will have to look at your economy. The number of resources that are on the board indicates uh, the size of your economy. Fun thing, you do not necessarily have to control those resources. Those may be resources that you control or resources that other people control, but that still means that people may trade them with you. So it is still good that these trade goods are going around. Uh, when you have an action, a number of action points printed in white on a black background, you count the number of storage goods that you have, and you can keep track of those. Suppose that I have five. Then you take the number of uh, action points printed on that card, you subtract it by the number of goods, uh, from the number of goods, and you have the number of action points. Suppose the number was 3, I have 5, 5 minus 3 is 2. Now I have 2 action points for this turn. It's a little more complicated, but not really much. And it still rewards having a large economy. So you resolve um, those actions and finally it is time to use your, your action points. Uh, early in the game what you can do is to expand, that's the main thing that you'll try to do. Uh, to expand you choose one of the available chiefdoms that you do not control yet, spend the an action point to try to incorporate that the selected chiefdom in your 
kingdom in your empire, you will die. If you roll higher than the number printed there, then you take control of it and you place a peace pipe on that, on that chiefdom, which also indicates that you're starting working towards uh, controlling this track. When you control a chiefdom, if there is another chiefdom available, which another box which has not been uh, used yet, doesn't have a chiefdom, then you draw another chiefdom and you place it there again on its unmounted side. So what you're trying to do is to expand, uh, in this case this is a wilderness so nothing happens there, but then you could move your peace pipe there by spending action points and then you get to place a chiefdom in the next space. So in the initial phase of the game you establish connections by placing peace pipes there which sort of like truces with the local population they indicate the size of your empire. Another action you can do in the early phase in the hopeful era is to spend action points to mound a chiefdom. To do that you need to spend a number of action points equal to the number printed here. I spent three action points and I mounded this. Mounded chiefdoms are pretty important. This is why you do not necessarily want to expand them as, as much as you can. You want to find a good balance between the size of your empire and the number of mounted areas that you can count on. But this time of prosperity is not going to last forever. Once you are done with this deck then you move to the bigger deck and when you do so then enemy armies start showing up and they show up right at the, at the gates of your empire. They simply are added, oh I just added them randomly, uh, what am I doing? You add them at the borders of your empire right outside of your gates. So right outside of the areas that are uh, delimited by their, by your peace pipes. That should be it pretty much with the placement of the, of the, of the enemy armies. And from that moment on these enemy armies start pushing against you. You flip the next card, you see if there is a civilization that is in decline or in ascension and then you advance the enemy armies for on their path towards your, towards uh, Cahokia. If they're trying to advance against a peace pipe, you remove the peace pipe and that annuls the, the advance, uh, which is good. If there is no peace pipe, then they will advance. And again, they're trying to get there and to destroy you. You advance all of these things, uh, all of the enemies, then you spend actions and you repeat the procedure. Get resources, uh, advance and spend actions and so on and so forth and this is how the the game works. Resolve the occasional or I say the frequent revolt and you continue like this spending actions and trying to defend. Now what can you spend actions for in the um, in the post Hopewell era in the Mississippian era? Well you can keep uh, mounding, that's an action still available, you can keep fortifying Cahokia by buying clicks for your defenses. You can, if you choose to use the optional rule, improve your storage pits, but very important, you can attack hostile armies. You spend an action to do so, action point, you roll a die, you need to roll equal uh, to, actually you need to roll higher than the number printed on the army that you're attacking. Modifiers may apply. Um, in the Mississippi area you also gain a bonus, which is this leader bonus, you can spend it for several advantages including being able to roll two dice and to choose the best one when you're attacking an opponent. So if the modified die roll after you take into account possible penalties or bonuses is higher than the number that you roll there, the enemy retreats. This is pretty standard procedure in in uh, states of siege games. But in states of siege games usually if you fail an attack roll nothing happens, the enemy sits there. Here there's a chance that actually you will get in trouble. If you're only one as you're attacking an opponent actually that attack costs you an extra action point. You may lose an action point in that attack. Another thing that happens that's pretty neat I think is that during the advance phase when the enemies are advancing against you, if they try to attack one of your mounted areas, 
you can ask the local population to defend the area for you if it's mounted. So you can have a defense roll, you roll a die, and there is a good chance that the enemy will be sent back. But if you roll a 1 during that defense roll, then the area is degraded to an unmounted area. So it's very different from other games in the system because actually is there are negative penalties that apply directly to you. In other games the negative penalty is simply the absence of a positive result. Here bad stuff does happen to you as a result of your own die roll. Ro die rolls. You can spend action points and use that marker to purchase new peace pipes that you place on the map and you can spend actions to repair the breached walls. Uh, then there are also other optional things. Overall these are the main actions that you can do. Place down peace pipes, attack your opponents, um, I mean by spending action points. And this, uh, this means that the game has less options, I find, than other games in the system. But still, the system generates a lot of events between defense roles and things that change around, the peace pipes that come and go, ways in which you can spend the marker. There's still a lot of stuff that you can do, even though it seems to me that the list of available actions is shorter than it otherwise would be in other games. You can push back the enemies by as much as you want and can. You will not expand your empire by doing so. The times where you use this cup are over during the Mississippian area. Towards the bottom of this deck, of the Mississippian deck, there is a Spanish card. When it comes out, then you add the Spanish army, which is bad. The Spanish army also will get a random leader which you associate with them. In this case, suppose I got Coronado. And the Spanish army starts immediately advancing against you. They advance by one space, then you get a free action that you can use to attack them or anybody on the board. Point is, if you haven't attacked them and you haven't successfully sent them back, and here is the, the here you have the um, the number that you have to exceed to stop the advance. If you fail to uh, stop the Spanish with your free move, then they move again, and again you have a free action. What are you gonna do? You use it against them or somewhere else. If you fail, and if you don't stop them, they keep advancing. After they are done with their advance, you place the smallpox marker in the in the um, action uh, in the storage pits track on the space indicated by the place where they landed. For example, now they are in the space number three. Then I place the smallpox marker in the three space of that area of that track. That means I can never have more action points than three now because of the toll that the smallpox took on my people. Once you resolve the Spanish card that brought those annoying people on the map, you do not discard it simply. You shuffle it in with the cards that will be remaining at the bottom of the deck. Now I haven't set up the final deck appropriately, but suppose that it's like this. You shuffle this card in once the card and then you keep resolving cards normally now in the Spanish era other penalties apply for example you cannot purchase new peace pipes once they're gone they're gone the maximum number of peace pipes that you could have was limited already well becomes limited in later phases of the game so you keep playing with the penalties with people that keep pounding at you until you find the Spanish card again uh, the Spanish will try against to advance uh, violently against you. If you manage to survive that attack, and maybe I don't need to say this, and if, we if you have survived until then in the game, then you win the game. You win the game by going through the deck until you survive the Spanish card twice. The Spanish card indicates both the beginning and end of the Spanish era. You lose the game if enemies ever enter the central area of the board that you try to defend uh, from most of the game. This game feels very different from other games that I played, including the games in the States of Siege system. I like the initial era, which 
I was afraid it would feel a little bit like an excessively long setup, but it really feels like a mini game in which you're like, hey, there's nothing wrong in just expanding and having fun, gathering, uh, gathering resources and strengthening my 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 possessions because you know that then the enemies will start attacking you. I find that uh, I found that part not as exciting as when you're fighting against enemies that see you from all directions. But in a certain sense, still exciting because you know that there's a countdown clock, a limited amount of time that you have before uh, the attacks start, that is a limited amount of time that you have to prepare yourself. And the, uh, and the enormous variety of ways in which the initial stage of the game can play out uh, really gives this game huge replay value. You may find yourself with initial empires of completely different configurations, some larger, some smaller, some more mounted, less mounted, with different resources. A lot of things may happen there. So when the enemy armies pop out of nothing and they start sieging your empire, um, you may find yourself in vastly different situations. The number of actions that you can take is smaller than you find in other games, but it is still a good number. The actions are relevant, and there are still things that happen on the board, ways in which you can use resources and bonuses, and you can choose if you want to risk a defense, um, which may degrade your possessions, or if you want to figure out other ways. Uh, there are decisions I find here that are ingrained within the system, even though they are not in the traditional list of actions that you have in other si states of siege games. Uh, I like the story, I like the narrative, definitely a narrative oriented game. Um, it gave me a better appreciation of the history behind the Cahokia Mounts that I visited uh, some years ago, a better overall understanding of some of the dynamics of Native American life, uh, very general, very broad concepts, but learning them through games is always interesting and it just gives you a different form of involvement as a you somehow somewhat uh, take on the role of the of the culture being described in the design as opposed to reading about it in the in a book the two things are not mutually exclusive but sometimes it is precisely by playing a game that then i want to know more about the topic in conclusion this is a good game a very good implementation of the states of siege system may not be my favorite in a game in the system, but the contenders, the other games in the system are really, really good. This is a system that sets the bar pretty high. Very, very good game. Good system, good implementation, great opportunity to learn about this topic, a topic that you do not find covered very often in war games. Good design, good product overall. I recommend it, I enjoy playing it, and I hope you give it a try.